love you so much. We, we, just as we sing, we, we're here to crown you with many crowns. We're here to uh, recognize God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, three in one, as our Trinitarian God, whom we are here to serve, whom we are here to love, whom we are here to honor as we, as we preach your word, as we seek your face, as we praise your name. And Lord, I just pray that as we uh, do hear from your word yet once again, it will cut through us, it will move through us, it will change us, and we will come away loving you more than we did before, and more motivated to serve you than we've ever been. We give you these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. So we're in a section of the Gospel of Mark where... Jesus is kind of interacting with the authorities in Israel at that time. And, and, and for, for a good while, off and on in our sermons, we're going to be talking about Jesus and his interactions with the Pharisees, what are called the elders, which would be the members of the uh, Sanhedrin. That was a 77-member council in Israel at the time. And a lot of times it'll talk about the teachers of the law as well. In, uh, if you read the old King James, these guys were called the scribes. But a scribe is a way of describing the teachers of the law. And these were some of the authorities in Israel that saw Jesus as a threat to their authority. And his interactions with them are something that uh, is very, very important in the Gospel of Mark. And in fact, in all the Gospels. One of the challenges, uh, kind of pulling back the wizard's curtain here, as it were, not that I'm the wizard, it's just a metaphor, but one of the challenges is at times when we want to have applications for ourselves in the Word of God, but, we're, but a passage is directed to a very different crowd, we got to use our, our, our kind of our thinking cap. I put my hand up because I had a teacher in school that used to say, raise your hand and find your thinking cap and, you know, pull it down because it was like time to think, time to learn. And that's something we kind of have to do here as we think about something that is addressed to non-believers who rejected the authority of Jesus Christ in their life and basically killed him because of his challenge, his rival challenge to their authority. I really hope that's not where you all are at today, and I really don't think it is. I, I, I've had a chance to meet so many of you, to talk with you about the Lord, and I know that we, we're, we're here to... We're here as believers in Jesus Christ to lift up his holy name, to confess him as Lord, to lay our lives down in obedience. However, when we recognize that all scripture is uh, practical for teaching and righteousness for all of us, we do want to see what we can learn from these things as well. And so in preaching and Bible teaching in general, there's kind of a two-step process of understanding what it meant to uh, the original audience and then understanding what it means for us today. That is part of the, uh, the Bible study process for all of us as well as the Bible uh, teaching, teaching process. So that's what we're going to do with what, what is often called the, the parable of the tenants. I like to call them the bad tenants. The tenants to the, uh, the grape field, the, the vineyard, that we'll be talking about today. One of the things that's very popular among contemporary people of all ages is this phenomenon that we call social media. Some of you, in, in, in true godliness, do not use social media. And that's great for you. I have to confess that, that, that I, I do use one social media venue, Facebook. Uh, one, of our, one of our youth told me one time, I was asking him something about Facebook, and he's like, oh, that's, a, that's an old people thing. Uh, and, you know, at this point, Facebook is kind of an old people thing, and I told him, and, and it was true from his perspective. I mean, you may not think of me this way, but I was like, yeah, that's, that's fitting. I am an old person, and from the perspective of this particular conversation, I was. But one of the things I find intriguing about social media is social media is a social commentary. And one of the things I've been seeing for, the, for all the time I've been on social media, and I got involved in Facebook in about 2008, so I've been doing this a lot longer than maybe I should have been and spent more time on it than I probably should have, but one of the things I've noticed is it tells us so much about what's going on in the culture around us. And if you have different friends on Facebook from different ways of looking at the world, you see kind of where they're coming from. And here's something I've noticed about many of my friends, and I have many friends who are believers in Jesus Christ. They confess faith in Jesus Christ. 
And many of the things I've seen in the last, you know, whatever that math adds up to, you know, 13 years or something that I've been doing this Facebook thing, is that a lot of people are very, very concerned about what's going on in the world around them. They really want God to change the world around them. They want God to fix the world around them. And I think what sometimes they're missing is that God is a lot more interested in fixing them than he is fixing the world around them. He's a lot more invested in working change in his church, in exposing the sin in his church. And I'm talking about the church universal here, and, and particularly the American church, as, as people who are uh, those who confess faith in Christ, but sometimes they are a little out of whack in the way we think about things. And in, in, among American believers, we want God to fix what's happening around us, and he wants to fix what's in here. And in this one way, we have something in common with the original uh, audience of uh, the parable of the tenants. Some of us do, and this is something to think of. I have one friend, a, a lady, she's a mother of little girls, and she is so concerned about all the stuff that's going on where they're letting, I don't know, like transgender people read books to little kids in libraries and things like that. And that is very concerning. We should be concerned about these things. But this mother of two little girls on Facebook, she'll have one, uh, one, she'll have one Facebook post that's like about how horrible it is that they're letting you know, such and such a person read books to little kids in libraries. And her next Facebook post will have a picture of Aquaman without his shirt on and some, you know, some comment about how attractive she thinks he is. And it's like, uh, you know, don't take your little girls to the library, but what are you teaching them? Not that I have anything particular against Aquaman, but I think we can kind of put together some of the, the tensions that we're, uh, that we're seeing. Where, where we're wanting God to fix what's out there and not always wanting him to fix what's going on in here. Mark, one, Mark chapter 12 and verses 1 to 12 tells us the parable of the tenants. It says, Jesus began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a pit for the wine press, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants to collect from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. But they seized him. They beat him. They sent him away empty-handed. Then he sent another servant to him. They struck this man on the head and treated him shamefully. He sent still another, and that one they killed. He sent many others. Some of them they beat. Others they killed. He had one left to sin, a son whom he loved. He sent him last of all, saying, Surely they will respect my son. But the tenants said to one another, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. What then will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. Haven't you read this passage of scripture? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Then the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders looked for a way to arrest him, because they knew he had spoken the parable against them. But they were afraid of the crowd, so they left him and went away. If you ever do a, a biblical study of all the parables, here's an interesting thing you're going to find. Most of the time when Jesus gives parables, he gives parables for the crowds not to understand them. So that people will then come and, and ask him questions, people who really want to know. It's kind of like, do you really want to know them? Come and ask him. And we have several times when Jesus interprets a parable for, uh, for his disciples. The reason I mention that is because this parable today is in stark contrast to the way Jesus usually does parables. It says at the end that the, the elders, the, the teachers of the law... 
the Pharisees, they knew exactly what he was saying. They understood the parable. There were no mysteries. They understood this one. He was uh, kind of giving it to him, and there were no gains. Here, Jesus sought for clarity, even for the unbelieving audience. The authority structure in Israel, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, the elders, um, they continue to be a factor in this section of Mark. At the end of chapter 11, they had questioned Jesus' authority, and we, we, we had that, that, that famous interaction about, yeah, I'm not going to tell you by what authority I do these things. And that questioning of his authority, that question of the authority of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and We've said a lot of times, and perhaps you'll remember, that the theme of the entire Gospel of Mark is the authority of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That question is what leads into the parables we see in this section. Identifying the characters of this parable really isn't all that difficult. Uh, the owner of the vineyard in this case would be God the Father. I alluded to the fact that we believe that God is Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And God the Father, in this case, would be the owner of the vineyard. The tenants would be the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders. Now, I should mention that it is broader than that, but for the purposes of, of, of what Jesus is bringing them to, the tenants are the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders of his day. But when he alludes to these previous servants that have come, he's also... He's putting them in the same category as the evil rulers in Israel of yesteryear, of the time before he's speaking. People like uh, King Ahab, for instance, or uh, Rehoboam and Jeroboam, or, or many of the other evil kings of Israel and, and, and evil religious people in Israel who, uh, who had persecuted God's prophets who had come. Because the servants, he talks about the servants who came to collect the fruit at harvest time. Throughout the Bible, one of the things fruit or agricultural prosperity is used for is as a metaphor for good works that honor and glorify God. So God sent his servants in the Old Testament, the prophets, and they were emissaries to encourage the nation Israel to bear fruit. Harvest time isn't necessarily in every instance. It's talking about a time when God would expect fruit. We don't want to get too carried away with harvest time in this particular parable being one particular point, because each of the servants represent different of the Old Testament prophets, concluding with John the Baptist. It said he sent many servants, many Old Testament prophets, and we often say that John the Baptist was kind of like the last of the Old Testament prophets, even though he's in the New Testament, he's under the Old Covenant. We could say he's the last of the Old Covenant prophets. Now, one of the things when we read biblical history, we see that uh, we see that when prophets came to call people to repentance, they were not received most of the time very well. Oftentimes they were beaten, they were treated shamefully, sometimes they were killed, and Jesus makes many allusions to this. And John the Baptist, of course, was killed for telling the truth before uh, King Herod. The son that the father, that the vineyard owner who is God the father sent, is, of course, Jesus, who was kind of the, the, the final prophet in his prophetic office sent to call Israel to repentance on the heels of John the Baptist. The authoritative one, the very Son of God, the one who came with divine authority, and even him, these bad tenants, would beat and kill. And so, what does he, what does he say is going to happen? Jesus predicts that uh, God the Father is going to deal with these bad tenants. He's going to do away with them. He is going to uh, have them killed, and he is going to transfer the tenancy, if you will, to a different crowd. Now, this transfer of the tenancy to a different crowd, uh, uh, with Jesus coming, Jesus being killed, and then the father, uh, the the owner of the vineyard transferring the tenancy. This is talking about the events that are happening in and around the coming of Jesus and in the years following. 
Jesus comes, he calls Israel to repentance, he will ultimately be crucified, he will raise again, and uh, God will uh, begin to build his church. And one of the things we keep talking about is a shift between God's working with Israel as a theocratic kingdom and the new work, the brand new work he does in the church. As we study the prophecies that Jesus made, we see that one of the prophecies he made is how uh, God would judge this generation of Israelites. Ultimately, within a generation, uh, when there would be a, a war between Rome and Israel, we call this the, uh, the Roman-Jewish War, from about AD 67 to 70, roughly, roughly 35 years, give or take, and, and following after Jesus rose from the dead, and Rome will completely destroy Jerusalem, will, will, will kill the religious leaders who were there at the time, and these people will be wiped out. Now, of course, there's a transition phase as God is building his church, but the point being that God has a new phase. Sometimes we call this a new dispensation in his program where he's been working with Israel. Israel ultimately rejected Christ as Messiah, and God's dealings with Israel are stopped at that point as he begins to do a new work in the church. And uh, you, can, you can remember how Jesus had promised to Peter, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. That future prediction, I will build my church, is really interesting because it's a future prediction. God had not been building his church up to that point. He'd been working through Israel as the primary channel of his blessing. Israel had failed under the old covenant. As we transition into the new covenant, God is doing a new work that we call the church. And, of course, Peter would be a part of the working, the building there. The Gospels clearly, clearly prophesy the Roman and Jewish war as a judgment on God for the rejection of Christ. Now, we've talked in, in, in other sermons about how that does not mean that God is done with Israel. That's another subject, but how God will return to his dealings with Israel at a time future. Um, sometimes people, people put it this way, and I'm not saying it's the best way to put it, but in a sense, Israel's been put on God's shelf for a time in, in his workings in the church. That's a big subject. We'll talk about it another time in, in perhaps more detail. But in the meantime, God is prophesying here. Jesus is prophesying what God is doing in his working, how this generation of Israelites have rejected the authority of Christ and ultimately God rejects them and they'll be killed. Pretty serious stuff. In verses 10 to 11, Jesus quotes from the prophet Zechariah. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief foundation. The stone that the builders rejected, the builders here are those, the authorities in Israel that were supposed to be, in a sense, building the kingdom of God through faithful service to him, and they were not. So they rejected the stone, which is Christ, that came to, uh, to call them to repentance but this very stone then becomes the chief foundation of a new building that God is building, which we often call the church. Turn in your Bibles for just a moment to the book of Ephesians, if you have your Bibles. If you don't, it's a really good question why you don't. No, I'm just teasing. But um, Ephesians chapter 2, and we just want to make a quick allusion to this. Um, Ephesians chapter 2, and if you, go to, uh, if you go to verse 19, I just want to read you this little passage, Ephesians 2, 19 to 22, and it tells you a little bit about the work God is doing in the church. And this is alluding to Christ as the foundation stone, even as he is described in the prophecy of uh, Zechariah that Jesus alluded to. Ephesians 2, beginning in verse 19, speaking to those who are part of God's church, it says, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is being joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. 
that tells us that Jesus is the main foundation. Along with the apostles, the New Testament apostles and the New Testament prophets upon whom God is building his church, Jesus is the chief foundation for this new building project he's doing. Our VBS is coming up, and we're going to be talking about this building theme. And then you may have noticed we're making this place look a little bit like a construction site. And that's one of the, the theme ideas here, that God is building us into his building. Sometimes we think of God's house as a building like this church we're in right now. But God's house is the people of God corporately as God dwells in us and God is building us up. And, and, you, and you've, just, uh, you've just seen that, how we, the people, are being built up into a holy temple. We have wonderful facilities God's given us, but the facilities are not God's house. You and I, working together, we are God's house. This is what God is doing in the present age in response to what? We might say the failure of the tenants. The failure of the nation Israel under the old covenant. Now the chief priests, the teachers of the law, the elders, they understood exactly what Jesus was saying in this parable. They understood that he's saying, you're just like the evil rulers of old who killed the Old Testament prophets in, in at least approving of the murder of John the Baptist, even though King Herod did that, and in that they are going to, going to have a part in plotting for the murder of Jesus, they were just like the evil people of old. They understood, even if the disciples didn't fully understand all of this yet, the Pharisees and chief priests, they understood that Jesus was saying, you guys are going to be out. God's going to deal with you. And they didn't like that. But they had a problem at this point because the crowd had not yet turned against Jesus. And so they had to go away. They had to plot, how are we going to kill him? See, the crowds, the crowds still thought maybe, maybe Jesus was going to overthrow Rome. In his first coming, Jesus did not come to overthrow Rome or any other earthly empire. He came to die on the cross for our sins, rise again on the third day, and begin building that church we were just talking about. But many in Israel were still waiting for him to overthrow Rome, and so it wasn't a, an opportune time for the, the Pharisees and others to move in and see about killing Jesus just yet. They had to do it in secret, and kind of their, their object lesson that this guy's not going to overthrow Rome is when they're able to have Jesus successfully arrested and beaten, and Jesus isn't doing anything about it. And this is when the crowds will be like, crucify him. So they're angry, they understand Jesus is talking about them, they are still at the plotting stage. But they are, uh, they are ready to give God anything but repentance. Again, a pretty straightforward little parable, and it, it, it applies very directly to, uh, very directly to what was going on with those leaders at that point. So, of course, the question we have to ask is, what does it have to do with us? Sometimes we call this the so what factor. I remind you yet again that the theme of the Gospel of Mark is the authority of Jesus Christ as the divine Son of God. And as we think about his authority in our lives, it would be really easy for me to make the same applications week after week about how we need to submit to the authority of Christ in our lives. And so, we are probably going to have a version of that, let me confess. But I want to I just kind of connect that with some of what we were saying in the introduction to the sermon. The reason the religious leaders rejected Jesus was this. They wanted a Messiah to come, but they wanted a Messiah to come who was going to be a powerful military figure. They wanted a Messiah that was going to kick out Rome. They wanted a Messiah that was going to reestablish Israel as the central kingdom in the world. They were, uh, they were a kingdom who was under the rule of Rome, and uh, they wanted things to be turned around where Rome would be a kingdom that was under their rule, right? That was what they were hoping for. They wanted that kind of Messiah. But what they didn't want was Jesus to tell them they were doing anything wrong. They thought they had a good religious system down. 
Pharisees in charge, teachers of the law in charge. We got the Jewish Sanhedrin. They didn't want a Messiah that was going to come and say, you guys need to repent. You need to change your values. You need to change your perspectives. And I'm not all that worried about Rome, people. I'm not all that worried about the Roman occupation. What I'm worried about is your sin and your need for repentance. That was not what they wanted to hear. So when you think about what God's doing in your life and in your world, it's important for you to think about what do you want to hear versus what God needs you to hear. Are you more, are you more concerned with, with, with looking at the sins of broader, broader society and complaining about that? And, and, and people... The world, who don't know Christ, they're going to operate in systems that are opposed to Christ much of the time, most of the time, because they don't know Christ, all right? We need to share the gospel with them in the hope that they'll come to Christ. But we can expect the world that doesn't know Christ to operate with systems that reflect the fact that they don't know Christ. The question is, us who do know Christ— how are we going to conduct ourselves, and are we going to be so busy looking at the world around us and the problems in the world around us that we're, we don't take any time to look inwardly and allow God to expose the sin in us and lead us to what? Uh, to seeking his change. That is the question we need to ask. I remember a time I went to uh, talk to a friend of mine in college. A very good friend. I don't talk to him near enough these days, but, but his, name was, uh, his name was Donovan, Donovan Crawford. And uh, I went to talk to Donovan one night in our, dorm, in, our, in our dormitory. I went and knocked on his dorm room because I had said something that I thought he had misunderstood. I was worried he thought I was saying something I didn't say, and I was worried I might have, I might have hurt his feelings or some of our friends' feelings. And so I went to clear that up. And Donovan allowed me to... Uh, he allowed me to tell him about, about what I had said, and he accepted the clarity I gave. And then he said, now, while we're talking about this, Pete, I'm just going to let you know. Sometimes you say things that can really communicate the wrong thing, can, can, can be hurtful to people, can seem disrespectful to certain people. I mean, he said, this is kind of, you know, since you came and since we're talking about this, I want you to know, Pete, you got a problem here with the things you say. And, you know, I really think it would be good for you to change that, and my goodness, then you would be so much less likely to be misunderstood or not misunderstood when you're saying something you shouldn't say. Kind of gave me a choice, you know. How am I going to respond to this? Am I going to say, no, I... Oh, Donovan, don't you understand? I'm a biblical studies major. I know the Bible. I'm committed to following Christ. I, I know the Bible better than you. What are you talking about, man? If I say something, you can bet it's perfectly fine to say. I could have responded that way. Not the right way to respond, for one simple reason. He was right, and God had brought him into my life to help me reckon with this problem I was having about some of the things I had been kind of regularly saying. Maybe sometimes uh, thinking it was in good humor. Maybe sometimes having a point that, that went beyond good humor that I was trying to get at. But whatever it was... I needed the Lord's conviction in this area. This is kind of a broader issue we got to ask. How do we respond to those who God brings into our lives to help us see the problems we have? Sometimes we're confronted with, with, with issues we have by godly brothers and sisters who love us enough to tell us the truth. How do we respond? Are we like, well, no, I got this together. No, I know the Bible. Whatever the case may be. Or are we going to have the humility to at least pray about whether God is showing us something that could really use some reckoning. What are, we, what are we communicating to our children? What are we communicating to those around us? What kind of example are we setting? Remember, friends, that the Gospel of Mark was written to a church that was actually under persecution. Everyone were praying for different aspects of the persecuted church. When, when the Gospel of Mark was written, assuming that the usual dating that most scholars take is correct, when the Gospel of Mark was written, the emperor of Rome at that time was rounding up Christians and burning them on stakes in his garden to illuminate his garden at night. He was doing horrendous things to Christians. One of the questions 
One of the questions many Christians were no doubt asking in Rome is, why isn't God stopping all this persecution? It's just so you know, it was a couple of hundred years before, before persecution really stopped in the early church. So there's a really long time, and then it, it came up before too long again. Uh, and, and there's more Christian persecution in the world today than there was in the world of the New Testament. But they're like, why isn't God stopping this persecution? And just imagine living in Rome in danger of being burned at the stake in Nero's garden. Imagine you're crying out to God. And what if God was to bring somebody to your house in Rome that's talking to you about some sin that you need to reckon with in your life? Your, you know, one of your church leaders, maybe, or just one of your brothers and sisters in Christ comes to you and lets you know about the sin you need to reckon with. And you're like, well, hey, wait a minute. Don't you know they're burning people alive? Who cares if I, have a, if, 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 if I lose my temper too much? I you know that they're, they're burning people at the stake. God is more interested in fixing us than he is fixing the world around us. We believe that Christ is coming again. We believe that he is going to make everything right. We sing that song today that talks about how there will be justice. All will be new. God's got that covered, and it doesn't mean, we'll talk more about this next week, it doesn't mean we're not good citizens of the world we live in. It doesn't mean we try to, uh, we try to see change in the world around us as God allows. But friends, remember that God's primary interest in this age is building his church, not building earthly kingdoms. And building his church means that believers like you and me, we need to take a close look inside before we get too carried away with taking a wide look outside. When we remember that uh, Jesus ministered to a society that lived under Roman oppression, and Mark wrote to a church that was living under Roman oppression, we're left with the question of how do we respond to Jesus when we want him to fix our society and he's more interested in fixing us? The church of Jesus Christ, the way he's building us up together, that is the most important thing God is doing right now. So let's let God's focus become our focus, and let's let our greatest concern be first ourselves and then one another as we seek to grow together and build one another up and be the church that Jesus Christ is calling us to be. Let's not reject authority when it tells us what we don't want to hear. Let's let God uh, clarify and clean out and help us to make the changes we need to make. One of my favorite philosophical quotes comes from Mrs. Potts. Mrs. Potts is a uh, teapot in the Disney, Disney film Beauty and the Beast, if any of you are uh, you know, familiar with that. And one of these quotes that Mrs. Potts so wisely gave us is how sometimes when we, when we look inward at our lives, she, she gives this little phrase that says, bittersweet and strange, finding you can change, learning you were wrong. How willing are we to let God show us that we are wrong about one thing and another and allow him to do his, his work in us, even if we're not getting everything we want out of life? Let's pray about that. Let's hold one another up together. Father, we love you. We praise you. We love your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you that you sent him to die on the cross for our sins, to rise again on the third day to ascend into heaven, to sit at your right hand, Lord. And as we think about that, we're thankful that he is coming again and he will make everything right. But Lord, for those of us who have trusted fully and completely in Jesus Christ as our Savior, we realize that your Holy Spirit is living in us. Your Holy Spirit shows us what we need to see. Your Spirit does a work of conviction, Lord. And even as, a, even as we think about the, the Israelite leaders who would not respond to the conviction of the preaching of the Son of God, we pray that we will be different that we will be, respond to the conviction of the Holy Spirit in our hearts and in our lives. We pray that you'll continue to do your mighty, mighty building work in your church. We pray that you'll teach us how to love one another, 
You'll teach us how to show grace to one another and to those outside of the church as well. You'll teach us to forgive. You'll teach us to uh, extend help. You'll teach us to be fully committed disciples of Jesus Christ in all that that means. We pray that his heart will become our heart. We give you glory and honor and praise in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen.